Our lesson for today from the Standard Lesson Commentary is for August the 28th. This is from Unit 3 and it is Lesson 13. And in the Standard Commentary, the lesson is entitled, Love Fulfills the Law. The devotional reading is Deuteronomy, the 13th chapter, verses 15 through 20. The background scripture is Romans 12, 1 and 2. Also, chapters 13, verses 8 through 14. The printed text is Romans 12, 1 and 2. Also, Romans 13, verses 8 through 10. And our key verse is Romans 13, verse 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth one another has fulfilled the law. Our lesson's aims are summarize the relationship between a living sacrifice and living with the continual obligation to love one another. Understand why neighbor love is the underlying assumption behind the ethical commandments. Help prepare a worship service that is focused on the theme of being a living sacrifice. Now, our lesson is focused on two very powerful um, Two very powerful outcomes that are lifted in the lesson and we've been studying in the book of Romans uh, for the past few weeks uh, this culminates the end of those chapters that we have studied and learned some valuable lessons and this is to bring us to the end or the culmination of those chapters that we have previously engaged in. And the gist or the expectation from the lesson is somewhat centered around the introduction. And I would like to read that uh, to basically just set the tone as we begin to delve into the lesson. It reads, one of the most remarkable phenomena we observe in nature is the change of a caterpillar into a butterfly. The caterpillar is a worm-like creature with many feet, eating leaves as it crawls among the plants. It sheds skin as it grows larger, eating continually. Finally, it spins a cocoon around itself and seems to go into hibernation. After many days, this creature emerges from the cocoon. It looks nothing like the caterpillar, the caterpillar it once was. For now, it is a six-legged insect with glorious wings. Formerly, limited to waddling around on plants and trees. It can now fly, for it is a butterfly. Scientists call this transformation from caterpillar to butterfly a metamorphosis. Our lesson is focused on sacrifice, transformation, and love. Before we begin to address the scriptures, I want us to look at a few characteristics in this transformation of the caterpillar into the butterfly. One of the things that it speaks of is that when it's in a worm-like form and it is crawling around that it feeds among or it feeds from those things at the level that it is upon it 
that it is feeding from not the level that it will up, obtain to not the level that it eventually emerges to but it's feeding from the level that it's on but as it begins to change then the commentary said that it begins to shed skin as it grows larger so when we think of this here sometimes uh, we would think that if we begin to shed something we would actually be losing weight uh, we would become lighter but here it says that as the caterpillar sheds skin it grows larger eating continually its diet has changed and sometimes in our life uh, we are heavy because of the diet the environment the practices that we have allowed ourselves to succumb to and it is a weight but when we change and move up above that level we shed that weight but we actually increase the increase is on the new diet that we're eating and so while we're shedding things that pull us down while we're removing from ourselves things that are weights that make us heavy we are actually becoming lighter on another diet and the other diet actually is making us bigger in one dimension while we were shallow in that same dimension because of the diet we were feeding from and it goes on to say how that once the diet has changed then the caterpillar spins itself into a protective shield which is called a cocoon and in our form of transformation sometimes we have to shield ourselves from those things that were weights from those things that were destructive from those things that were deterrence and were not profitable for us so we have to remove ourselves from that element and it may appear as though we have withdrawn ourselves and that we are anti-sociable or that we're not hanging out as we used to as though we have gone into hibernation sometimes we have to remove ourselves in order to improve ourselves and so it then says and we understand the process but once it has removed itself from the environment it once was in it then comes out of that shell and it now emerges as a new creature so when we begin to get in to the lesson I wanted to just kind of uh, set the tone for these three topics that we want to look at uh, sacrifice transformation and love now the scripture starts off and it says I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God and the introduction is that now that you have heard all of those things that we have spoken of up to this point now therefore I beseech you I now want you to draw your mind in since you have listened to all the things I've spoken to you up to this point now I want to collect all of that 
to explain to you how that was to prepare you for the culmination of what it was we presented. Now where it says by the mercies of God, uh, sometimes when we speak of mercy, we approach it as it is a pardon from God, a pardon from my just due, <laughs> a pardon from the punishment that I was due, but God being merciful, God being loving and forgiving, God has forgiven me and has not inflicted upon me the punishment that I was due. So therefore God has been merciful unto me. And a lot of times it is approached as though it is an escape from chastisement that I should have received, but God showed mercy. And I am not addressing that to suggest that that's not the case, that God that is not the way that mercy is actually explained or understood. I'm just trying to add another dimension to that understanding. And I would like to do that uh, from the 25th number of Psalms. And I want to start it at the fourth verse. Uh, this is David speaking. And he says, the 25th number of Psalms, the fourth verse. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, your tender mercies and your loving kindness for they are from of old do not remember the sins of my youth nor my transgressions according to your mercy remember me for your goodness sake O Lord now here as David is petitioning the Lord we look at uh, what David is actually asking for, not just mercy, but to be shown the ways of the Lord, for the Lord to teach him the proper paths that he should travel, for the Lord to share his truth with him and tutor him, teach him, instruct him and guide him for he identifies God by saying that he, you, almighty God, are my salvation. I wait on you all day. But the point that we want to lift from this is, is that uh, mercy is not just granted without a response. Uh, we don't plead for mercy just to continue us in our same behavior and actions. David is pleading for mercy, but also pleading for the Lord's teaching, for the Lord to place him on the correct path, uh, for the Lord to speak truth to him and to tutor him and to instruct him and improve him. So when we or speaking of uh, mercy is not just a pass from punishment. It's not just an escape, but it is a plea not just to be pardoned, but also that I may improve myself. And then we come to the part of the sacrifice where it says that you may present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, we understand about all of the animal sacrifices that were offered 
And I would just like to uh, read from the 10th chapter of Hebrews just a couple of scriptures. Hebrews tap, uh, chapter 10. I'm going to begin at the first verse. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. And it says, For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. So now we know that the sacrifices that were offered were like a prototype of the sacrifice that God in the person of his son Christ Jesus would ultimately make the final sacrifice for us all but just look at the practices of this verse 2 says for then would they not have ceased to be offered this is to say if they were made perfect from these sacrifices would they have to continue to do them if this, if this is what made them perfect? It goes on to say, For the worshipers, once purified, would have no more consciousness of sin if the animal sacrifices had cleansed them totally. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls or goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, speaking of Christ, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me in burnt offerings and sacrifice for sin, he became our sin offering. You had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. Righteousness, goodness, Kindness was sacrificed. Holiness was sacrificed in our place. The question that we must ask ourselves, as Paul is saying that we present ourselves as a living sacrifice. These animals were dead sacrifices. It was even mentioned in the commentary that they would kill the animals as they prepared them for the altar because if they brought the animals onto the altar still alive that they would be moving and trying to free themselves from the sacrifice. And so therefore they offered them dead animals but what Paul is saying is is that we should be living sacrifices not dead sacrifices but we should be living sacrifices which is wholly acceptable unto God which is our reasonable service so as we look at what our sacrifice is to be when we speak of it in reasonable service it has been mentioned that in the hebrew the word translated which is a noun for service can also be translated worship and it says when we worship god we are serving god and when we serve god we are worshiping God. So as we look at our daily activities, whence we go about uh, to those things that God has called us to and enabled us to perform, 
whatever line of work of service that we are rendering to help others when we do this we are serving God but through the process of serving God we are also worshiping God now this brings us to a very significant part of our lesson and this is the part that says to us and be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God now this part this one passage of scripture right here is enough to perform a whole text upon well we're going to try and indulge ourselves but at the same time be brief in our description first of all when we speak of being not conformed to this world uh, that is not an escape for not obeying any guidelines or any direction or following any uh, rules or anything of that sort uh, some people say I'm a non-conformist I don't conform to anything uh, I, I follow my own rules I, I, I don't need nobody to tell me uh, what to do I, I do my own thing uh, here where it speaks of being not conformed to the world uh, is definitely definitely not telling us that uh, don't follow any guidelines uh, you don't have to practice any moral values uh, uh, the world is uh, full of corruption and everybody just uh, find your own path your own niche and just you know do your thing and if it feels good then hey you know enjoy yourself uh, this is not what it means by not being conformed to the world in fact what it is truly saying is not to take any form to anything that is ungodly not to take form to anything that is corrupt that is destructive that is demeaning that is a deterrent that breaks us down so a lot of times we take too much ownership on things that are destructive, on things that are deterrents, on things that do become heavy weights for us. And then we will quickly say, I don't, nobody tells me what to do. Oh yeah, the world is telling you what to do and you are following those paths. So, but one of the key, um, one of the key statements in this scripture is where it says to be ye transformed by the renewing of your address. Is that what it says? Be, uh, oh, by the renewing of your career. Wait a minute. Let me. Is by the renewing of your dress your style of uh, apparel no it says oh by the renewing of your diet no it says by the renewing of your mind now this is very key right here because we are in a very mind controlling period not that the world has not always tried to dominate and control human mind but we are in a period where the control the manipulation the deception of the mind is at an all-time high and it is so prevalent till many people don't realize that we are being 
under, we are under attack daily through all means of where, where thought and suggestions and symbols and underlying manipulative meanings are being just advertised at a level that has been unprecedented and it is constantly in the forefront of our minds today and if we are not careful we find ourselves falling into those subtle practices without knowing why we are practicing them so it says by the renewing of our minds and for some strange reason most people would say that we want change the caterpillar wanted change most people in our daily discussions around our family members on the job socially we hear it on talk shows and everywhere that we want change and yet the very people who talk about change we very seldom find ourselves as advocates or agents of change some of us not all and we never can get into that generalization of saying all but some of us can't even change the way we go to work we have a route that we travel every day and if for some reason there's a traffic jam or we have to reroute sometimes we uh we don't know another route or another way to get to our destination because we have gotten so settled in our way of traveling this same path every day until we can't even change the way that we arrive from one point to the next but we want change and then the, some of us we can't change our daily activities we are locked in to a routine and we can't get out of our normal daily practices but we keep saying we want change and some of us have mustered up the strength and the determination to make a change in our diet only to fall back into our old eating practices so when we speak of being transformed it starts with the most powerful element within our being and that is with our mind back towards the latter uh, 80s early 90s it was discussed in magazines that the last frontier of exploration was the exploration of the control of the mind so Paul is telling us here that we will be transformed by the renewing of our minds. When something is renewed, it can't be renewed with old things. A lot of times we change our outer self, but we don't change our inner self we have to do if we would spend half as much time on trying to change our outer self as much as our inner self at least we would somewhat be balanced but we spend way too much time on trying to improve and change the external instead of the internal now I would like to close out with this uh, on the power of love 
and I, I want to uh, approach it from uh, this angle here. I'm going to go all the way uh, to the end where it says, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And at the end of verse 9 where it says, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love as we all know, is a very powerful emotion. But love is God, and God is love. I want to address this uh, from two passages of Scripture. Um, I believe one is in James. So uh, let's go to uh, that uh, scripture in James. This is James, the fifth chapter, verses uh, 19 and 20. And I lift this in light of the end of verse 9, which says, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. It reads, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Now, this is a great uh Comparison in scripture as action of love. Because if you've ever fallen or found yourself entrapped in the uh, mechanisms of society to bring us down and entrap us and to cause us to error in our actions, then just as someone and I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, neglecting the presence of God in this work, but a lot of times God works through people whom God sends in our path. So when we look here and it says, if anyone among you wonders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that whoever he was who turned a sinner from his error, that in this action, he will save a soul from death and that will cover a multitude of sins. And then I want to look at another expression and another action of love. And that would be out of uh, 1 Peter. It is uh, 1 Peter, the fourth chapter. I'm going to begin it at verse 7. And it reads, But the end of all things is at hand. Well, isn't that dead on? Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. I hope that we have understood that, first of all, Scripture tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And we are commanded that if we love God, we are to demonstrate love one to another. And it starts with loving ourselves and then loving ourselves enough to let that love overflow to others. So I hope that through the reading of the scriptures and the explanation of our lesson that you have received something that will help you along with myself 
to continue to work on ourselves, to build ourselves, improve ourselves, and to transform ourselves into what God would have us to be in this day and in this time. God bless you and God keep you is always our prayer.